and deliver you. And we look at verse number one, the Bible says, Keep not thou silence, O God. Hold not thy peace and be not still, O God. This is a plea to God. God, please, don't stay quiet about this. We've got a problem. I need you. I need you to intercede. We need you to step in. God, please help us here. Don't just be still. Don't just stand by and allow this to happen. We need you, Lord. For lo, thine enemies make a tumult. And notice it says your enemies, like God's enemies, not my enemies. Your enemies, God. Your enemies are out to destroy us. It says, and they that hate thee have lifted up the head. And it's going to start describing multiple groups of people here. But before we even get into all the people that are listed here, that are coming together as the enemies of the Lord. They're causing a tumult. They're causing a problem in the believer's life, in the children of God's lives. And this is a, a, a plea, a help. Just God, please don't keep quiet for this. You, you got to come down and set things right. You got to come down and help us. Uh, we need you. Verse number three, they have taken crafty counsel against thy people. And just notice those words, crafty counsel. So these are people, wicked people that hate God, are conspiring. They're being very crafty. They're being, uh, um, you know, clever, but but crafty for for evil intent. They're they're using and and you know the the wicked are always trying to set these traps, and they do so in subtle ways. Right? That, that's one of the, the key attributes of, of Satan himself is just how subtle he is. The Bible says that the, you know, the serpent was more subtle than any of the creatures. He's a subtle creature. Why? Because that's the, the best way to do the most damage and to gain the most trust is by not just being overt, not just being out in the open about it, but secretly, craftily will try to do things to cause the problems for people. And especially for God's people, right? The people that hate God are going to do their best to undermine and try to uh, just upend the work that's being done amongst God's people. This is why there's so many warnings and admonitions in the scripture about the false prophets and the false brethren that are going to creep in unawares. And, and you know, even Apostle Paul said, like, I believe it was Apostle Paul saying, you know, that, uh, um, No, it's not. It's Jude. Jude, and I don't want to misquote it because now my brain just had a, a, a brain fart, but I know exactly what I'm looking for here. Verse 3, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. And, and he's saying, look, I gave diligence to write you a common salvation, and it was needful to write unto you to do what? To earnestly contend. Uh, contention, contending here is fighting, right? You're, you're fighting for the faith. Why do you have to fight for the faith? For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained of this condemnation, ungodly men turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. And, you know, he, he brings up these people who are coming in and causing disruption and causing problems. And uh, even again, mentioning how they've been told before at near the end of Jude, but beloved, remember ye the words, verse 17, which were spoken before of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, how that they told you there should be mockers in the last time who should walk after ungodly lusts. These be they who separate themselves, sensual, having not the spirit. And just, just the fact that Jude is making reference of the other apostles saying, look, we've been warning you about this. And the apostle Paul is the one that said, you know, I cease not to warn you, right? Day and night with tears. I've been, I've been trying to warn you about this. Why? Because there is a fight, because we're in a spiritual battle, because when you're doing good and when you're going to try to keep the word of God and try to do the works, and especially the first works, you're going to have opposition. And there's going to be times then where the enemies of God are going to be conspiring and figuring out how can we craftily stop this work from happening? What can we do to blow up the work of God? And sometimes they want to literally just blow it up like they did with First Works Baptist Church, just blow up the building. 
and other times they're going to send people in to try to infiltrate and try to cause any reason to bring any type of bad name, any type of slander, any type of rebuke into the church, even if it's just guilt by association, right? And just, and just having false brethren in to just cause problems. Because from the public eye, then people will be like, oh man, there's always problems there and problems there and problems there. And sometimes people want to blame the pastor because of wicked people that have come out and done bad things. You know, it's like, it's not their fault. And to me, it's just more of a sign that they're doing something right, especially when they're getting rid of these people, right? They're popping up from within the midst and then they're being cast out. But some people get fatigued, they get weary, and they look at it and it's like, oh man, that's just a bunch of drama. And a bunch, you know, it's like, look, don't take it that way. We need to uh, just stay strong and continue and especially seek the Lord because the evil people, the people that hate God are going to be conspiring. They're going to have this crafty counsel against God's people. It's not just against God, against God's people. Amen. And consulted against thy hidden ones. Look at verse number four in Psalm 83. They have said, come and let us cut them off from being a nation that the name of Israel may be no more in remembrance. And of course, this is in the Old Testament and this is during the time when the nation of Israel was God's chosen people to be the nation that was going to bring forth the word of God. That was to be the nation whose God was the Lord. That was to be the nation where God was going to send his messengers and his apostles and his prophets and his teachers and going to deliver his word ultimately unto the world. But they were going to be that spiritual lighthouse there, his people doing his work until ultimately, finally, they ended up being replaced when God sent his only begotten son to the world and they rejected him. That's when God had the last straw and said, you know what, you are done the physical nation of Israel with being my people, and he's going to change that now to someone who's going to a nation, like a, a whole nation of people who are going to bring forth the fruits thereof. That is how then God has changed. Because in the past, hey, Israel was that nation that was bringing forth the fruits of Israel, was a nation doing a lot of the work for God, and they had gone back and forth, and you can see their whole history. And here we see. Look, Israel, of course, at this time is still the nation of the Lord. They're the nation of God. They're God's people who are uh, trying to stand for the Lord and for God's righteousness. And all the people that hate God, there's all these other wicked heathen nations that surround them that want to wipe them off the map, that want the nation of Israel to just cease to exist altogether. You know, the people that hate God want nothing more than to just never hear about the Lord ever again. And you know this is true when you, when you ever run across a true God hater and they lose their mind just at the, the, the sight of like a Bible or someone who might say so, a verse out of the Bible. or so, you know, We've all run across someone like that. And they just, they, they lose it. I mean, these are the people when you're going out soul winning and they just come charging at the, get off my property, you know, and just start yelling and screaming at you. And it's just like, dude, like, why are you so angry? And I'm like, well, I haven't even said anything yet. Like, I, I barely, like, stepped foot on your sidewalk. Like, it's, those are the people that are just, I mean, they hate God. Now, not all of those people are necessarily plotting against like us right but there's definitely th of that group of people they are definitely uh putting in crafty counsel against the people of god and the more there are the worse it gets of course and amongst the heathen nations and especially we're going to see this literally listed off they hate god so much and they want to have nothing to do with them so much that they just want it they just want it annihilated and this is why you see such what are all the, the adjectives I want to use? Oh, I could just look at Romans chapter 1 and see that list of, of adjectives like merciless, implacable, right? Describing the, the, the I don't even know how many letters they're describing now, the, the alphabet animal crew, that they, you know, how much they want to cancel and silence and censor and shut down anything 
that really truly stands for righteousness. They don't really care too much about the people who are doing nothing and the, you know, the Unitarian churches and stuff like that. They're all fine and dandy with that, but when it comes to someone actually preaching like the literal word of God, then it becomes a problem. Then it becomes shut them down and silence them and do everything they can, even to the point of violence, which it's going to get there in this country. It's like that in other countries, but right now, right here, it hasn't gotten too far to the point of violence, but they're, they're pushing the envelope. They keep on doing it. I mean, what do you call a pipe bomb at a, at a church building? You know, thank God no one was in there. It starts off with no one being in there, and then it turns into them doing that when people are in there as they get bolder, as they uh, continue to uh, hate God and, and continue with their crafty counsel. But this is what happens. And, um, yeah, we see, we see the desire. Come, let us cut them off from being a nation. They just want to, to wipe them out that the name of Israel may be no more in remembrance. And don't conflate this nation of Israel in this verse with the current nation of Christ rejecting religious Jews because they're not the same thing at all. And the people that want to wipe them off the map is not the same as these people here because the people who reject Christ are not the people of God at all. They've ceased to be the people of God. But I don't want to go deep into that subject. Let's just keep reading here in Psalm 83. Look at verse number 5. For they have consulted together with one consent. And a lot of times the heathen nations, they don't consent with each other, right? They've got their own wickedness, and they want to do their own things, and they don't have love for each other. But when they've got the common goal of fighting against the Lord or God's people, it's like, oh yeah, we'll all join together for that. And it's, it's interesting, too, how you can see that the, the people, the, the false brethren that have crept in, they all flock together when they get exposed, even if they do their own things and don't have any fellowship at all with each other for a long time. And then it's like, oh, hey, we've got a common target. Let's all join together against God's people and fight against them. It says here they've consulted together with one consent. They are confederate against thee. And this is the plea to God saying, look, Yes, they're going to fight against God's people, but what they truly hate is you. They've, been, they've come together in a confederacy against you, Lord. Please, you know, don't keep silence about this. Don't let them be able to speak the blasphemy and, and to have such pride and audacity as to think that they can stamp out your people. It's time to, to, to step in for us here, Lord, and show yourself strong in your people. Verse number six, the tabernacles of Edom and the Ishmaelites of Moab and the Hagarines, Gebal and Ammon and Amalek, the Philistines with the inhabitants of Tyre, Aser also is joined with them. They have hope in the children of Lot, Selah. So verses six through eight, it's just listing these various nations. And these are all nations that even historically within the context of scripture have always been these wicked heathen nations like they've never been righteous nations at all they've always been some of the worst of the worst i mean the philistines are always at war with israel uh Am ammon amalek i mean these are some of the nations that are supposed to be destroyed you've got uh the moabites the edomites you know all these people that have been just really wicked against the people of god are all joined together in this psalm here so this is a large group of people. They're banding together to fight against Israel. And as I mentioned, they're also well known as being very wicked and heathen nations. Look at verse number nine. So now here's the request. This is, this is what's happening. They're saying to God, hey, look, all these people, they're conspiring. They've, joined, they've made a confederacy. They're all unified in fighting against you and fighting against your people, dear Lord. Do unto them as unto the Midianites. And now we're going to see multiple references to stories within the book of Judges where God came in and used a leader, used a judge to deliver his people out of the hands of wicked nations and out of the hands of wicked people. So this is also 
uh, very good. I'm glad that this psalm is bringing this up because it's good to have this remembrance. It's good for us to have this remembrance when things seem to get really dark and it seems like everyone's against you. I mean, if you've got a whole bunch of nations banding together against you, against this small group of people, this smaller nation of Israel, compared to everyone kind of surrounding the nation of Israel, wanting to come against them and attack them, that, that puts you in a, in a tight spot, right? It's going gonna, it's gonna to be stressful, to say the least. And what we have is the remembrance, God, we know who you are, we know what you've done, and we know you can still do these things. Please come and save us. Please come and deliver us. Do unto them just like you did to the Midianites. Do unto them just like to Sisera, as to Jabin at the brook of Kaisan, which perished at Endor. They became as dung for the earth. Lord, I don't care how many nations are surrounding us and want to kill us. Make them like the dung of the earth. Because we know that you can do it, and we're going to trust in you to do that. Turn, if you would, to Judges 4. We're just going to look up a few of these examples briefly that are mentioned here in Psalm 83, just to see... What are they requesting them to do and to see the victory that God has wrought? And we're not reading through all of them. I mean, these are, some of these are lengthy stories, especially with um, like the Midianites. That's the story of Gideon, and that's multiple chapters in the book of Judges. Uh, we're going to start with looking at, and this is in, kind of interesting too, because it starts off referencing the Midianites, but then it brings up Sisera, Jabin, and that battle, which was not the Midianites, that was um, Cana the Canaanites in that battle, which a little bit different, right? And then, but, but it's kind of intermixing the Midianites, and we're going to see that that's brought up again in a few more verses in Psalm 83. But the whole point is this referencing this whole time period where there were people oppressing the children of Israel, and God wrought great deliverance from under the hands of these people, uh, which, again, it is, is shows us, you know, it's not just Egypt. It, Egypt isn't the, the exclusive story in the scripture. It's the most, probably the most important one and has a lot to teach, but, and it, and it was, you know, God really showed his arm strong by bringing them out and leading them out of Egypt, but that is far from the only time that God st has stepped in and delivered his people from persecution. It's happened time and time again throughout their history. Verse number one in Judges chapter four, the Bible says, and the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord when Ehud was dead. And the Lord sold them into the hand of Jabin, king of Canaan. So this is that Jabin being referenced in Psalm 83. That reigned in Hazor, the captain who, of whose host was Sisera. So Jabin is the king and Sisera is the captain of the host. He's the one leading the army, right? He's like the general, which dwelt in Herosheth of the Gentiles. And the children of Israel cried unto the Lord. So at first, the children of Israel brought this on themselves because they're the ones that have sinned against God. So God allows them to just go into this captivity, so to speak, or just to be oppressed and come under the, the control of a heathen country. But now they've turned to the Lord. Now they've been uh, oppressed. It says, they cried unto the Lord, for he had 900 chariots of iron in 20 years. He mightily oppressed the children of Israel. So this is now, now for 20 years, they've been, they've been dealing with this oppression. And it brings up, you know, all these chariots of iron. He had all this military strength. And it says, he mightily oppressed the children of Israel. And Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of Lapidoth, she judged Israel at that time. And she dwelt under the palm tree of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel and Mount Ephraim. And the children of Israel came up to her for judgment. And she sent and called Barak, the son of Abinoam, out of Kedesh Naphtali, and said unto him, Hath not the Lord God of Israel commanded, saying, Go and draw toward Mount Tabor, and take with thee ten thousand men of the children of Naphtali and of the children of Zebulun? And I will draw unto thee to the river Kishon Sisera, the captain of Jabin's army, with his chariots and his multitude, and I will deliver him into thine hand. So now this is... Deborah bringing forth the word from the Lord, saying that God is going to deliver him in your hand, but Barak, you're the one that needs to go into battle. You're the one that needs to lead the charge. You need to go, and God will bring this great victory. And all these, and this, so this is clearly what is mentioned in Psalm 83.9. It brings up Sisera, it brings up Jabin, it brings up the brook Kaisan. 
and this is exactly what's going to happen here. Jump down to verse number 13, and we'll see the, the fulfillment of this, because Barak is kind of like, well, I don't know, only if you go, then I'll go, and this other stuff. But he ends up going, okay? He ends up, uh, you know, he was a little weak, very weak in that sense, and, you know, God took away the glory that, that would have gone to him and, and put it in the hands of a woman since he needed a woman to, to be there for him and to hold his hand instead of him being a man and going out and fighting the battle as he ought to have. But jump down to verse 13 because at the end of the day, here's the thing, you know, and, and, and we talk about being a man. It's like, what more do you need than God saying, like, like I'm going to go and be with you. Why do you need the hand of a woman to go and support you when God already promised to bring you the victory? Like, just stand up and go, right? Just, just get up and go. You don't even, you, you know, it's like a guaranteed thing. When you hear the word of the Lord prophesied that God is going to bring you deliverance, it's good to go. Unless you got the mouth of a false prophet, right? So in that case, then you got to worry. But here, uh, Deborah clearly wasn't false, and, and she brought forth the word of the Lord. But like, you really... Uh, don't have anything to worry about. Verse 13, and Sisera gathered together all his chariots. So Sisera, see what's, what's going on, and he decides to bring the battle to Israel. He gathered together all his chariots, even 900 chariots of iron. So he brings his full force against them, and all the people that were with him, from Herosheth of the Gentiles unto the river of Kishon. And Deborah said unto Barak, Up, for this is the day in which the Lord hath delivered Sisera into thine hand. Is not the Lord gone out before thee? So Barak went down from Mount Tabor and 10,000 men after him. And the Lord discomfited Sisera and all his chariots and all his hosts with the edge of the sword before Barak. So God is out there fighting the battle for him. Now look, they showed up to the battle, absolutely, and they were fighting. But God is the reason why they were able to defeat the host of, uh, of Sisera and of Jabin the king and of all those 900 you know chariots of steel they were able to do all this because God went and delivered them so that Sisera lighted down off his chariot and fled away on his feet Sisera the captain of the host Sisera whose name is mentioned multiple times Sisera is supposed to be this you know th this powerful mighty you know captain of the host he's running away and fleeing because he got beat so badly because the Lord was out there uh, fighting the battles for him. And then, of course, it says here, verse 16, And Barak pursued after the chariots and after the hosts unto Herosheth of the Gentiles. And all the hosts of Sisera fell upon the edge of the sword, and there was not a man left. So this is a complete victory, total victory. So you're saying, when you're, when you're asking for God's help, this is a good story to bring up. Like, God, you destroyed all of them, like 100%. There wasn't a man left. You, you wiped them out. This is what we're asking for, God. Come back and stand up for us as you did with your people back in these days. And of course, the end of that, so we're not going to read the rest of it, but um, Sisera goes and, and he hides and he, has this, he talks to his woman. He wants to, to hide to jail. And, and he's like, you know, hey, hide me here. And she's like, oh, yeah, no worry. You know, don't worry. Just, just, just hide here and bring some uh, milk and butter in a lordly dish, and then he falls asleep, and she takes a, 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 a tent stake and just, <laughs> and just hammers that through his temples straight to the ground. Great story. I love that story. <laughs> and kills him. And she ends up getting the, you know, a lot of the glory for killing Sisera because Barak was too cowardly to go up by himself and just, and just fight the battle. But uh, God still ultimately just wrought the victory, right? Regardless of what, of what humans were, were being praised, God brought the victory there. Uh, also, who is mentioned here? Psalm 83, verse 11. So we're going we're gonna, to we're look at all of this. We, the Midianites were brought up briefly in Psalm 83, ver, from verse 9. Do unto them as unto the Midianites. And then there's a semicolon there, and it says, As to Sisera, as to Jabin, at the brook Kaisan, which perished at Endor, they became as dung for the earth. So we just kind of saw that story quickly. And then verse 11 says, Make their nobles like Orb and like Zeb. And the nobles are going to be the people that are oppressing them, the nobles of all these nations that are conspired together, they have brought a confederacy. He's like, the, the request now is, Make their nobles like Orb and Zeb, yea, all their princes 
as Zeba and as Zalmanna. Orb and Zeb, Zeba and Zalmanna were these kings or these princes of other wicked nations as well amongst the Midianites whom Gideon slew and pursued after and ultimately destroyed. And we'll read that story in Judges chapter 7. Again, a real brief summary, just a few verses, because these stories take a while to flesh out, but you probably already are familiar with them. Hopefully you are. If you're not, great stories. Read, read through the book of Judges for your homework. And I'm sure you'll see other examples, but these are the ones referenced in the psalm, so I just want to look at them quickly just to, to see what's being requested. Verse 22 says, and the 300 blew the trumpet. So th this is just the backstory. Gideon was chosen to, lead, to, to stop the oppression of the Midianites that they had, they had gotten into again because they'd been oppressed again. And he was chosen, and God you know, wanted him to call people together, and he was going to go fight against the Midianites, but there was too many people, and he, had, you know, he did all these different things to, to, to whittle down the number of people who were going to go with Gideon to the battle. And he, and he whittled it down essentially to 300 people. And because God wanted to make sure that it was known that God brings the victory, that the glory goes to the Lord, that he's the one that's going to get the credit. Like, because it, it, here's the thing, if you, if you bring out a force that's pretty close to equal, or maybe, you know, maybe you're a little bit of an underdog, but you still have this huge army, it's a lot easier for people to think, well, yeah, we're just the better fighters, we're the better warriors, we outwitted them, we just outfought them, we're better than them. Right? And people can walk away with more of a proud attitude of that victory, thinking like, we did all of this. And God's going, no. I'm, I'm going to save you, and I'm going to show you, you're only going with 300 people against this whole host of the Midianites that have been oppressing you, and that, that the, all the children of Israel have been afraid of. You only get 300 people to go with you. And he's going to make the impossible possible. And he's going to show that the victory belongs to the Lord. And that if you're trusting in God, you don't need anything else. That he is capable of bringing forth the fight. So he brings the 300. They kind of uh, sneak up. They've got their, their torches, their, their lamps, they call them. And they're, they're covered up so they can't see him. They're going at night. And then they shatter all the, the vases that are covering the, the, the lights, so then all of a sudden they, they see these people and they're blowing with the trumpets and they kind of bring this surprise element to the Midianites in the darkness to where they, they have this perception that like there is just a whole bunch of people there just ready to destroy them when really it's only 300 people, but this is what it looks like to them. And this is where we're picking up in the story in verse 22 of Judges 7. And the 300 blew the trumpets, and the Lord set every man's sword against his fellow, even throughout all the host. And the host fled to Beth Shitta in Zerath, and to the border of Abel Mahola unto Tabith. So in the confusion, you've got that army of the Midianites just kind of killing each other. Like their host is against themselves. Like they're, they're just fighting against themselves and, uh, and fleeing away because there's all this confusion that was brought forth. Verse 23 says, And the men of Israel gathered themselves together out of Naphtali and out of Asher and out of all Manasseh and pursued after the Midianites. So after this great event that's kind of spurring them now, like there's all this bloodshed and they're, they're running away, now you've got the Israelites all just kind of band, you know, joining together as they're fleeing away and joining in on the battle and chasing after them. Uh, verse 23 says, And the men of Israel... Uh, excuse me, verse number 24. And Gideon sent messengers throughout all Mount Ephraim, saying, Come down against the Midianites and take before them the waters unto Beth Bera and Jordan. Then all the men of Ephraim gathered themselves together and took the waters unto Beth Bera and Jordan. And they took two princes of the Midianites, Oreb and Zeb. So these are two of their leaders, two of their kings, their princes, Oreb and Zeb. And they slew Oreb upon the rock, Oreb and Zeb. They slew at the winepress of Zeb and pursued Midian and brought the heads of Oreb and Zeb to Gideon on the other side, Jordan. And I just love this. They slew the one at the rock, Oreb. So, like, he, you know, the, the, the rock crushed this God hater. And the other one was brought to the winepress of the wrath of God, essentially, 
with Z being, you know, th this is the illustration is that the one, the stumbling block of the rock, of the stone of Jesus Christ, right, crushed the one and the, the wine press of the wrath of God it was, is the, the same, is the fate that the other one uh, met there with Oreb and Zeb. That's kind of symbolically showing that these two wicked princes of these wicked nations, which is why, one of the reasons why, and turn if you go to uh, Judges chapter 8, where they said, make their nobles like Oreb and like Zeb, just destroyed and feeling the wrath of God. Verse 10, Judges 8, now Zeba and Zalmanah were in Karkor and their hosts with them, about 15,000 men, all that were left of all the hosts of the children of the east, for there fell 120,000 men that drew sword. Now, again, I know we're skipping around a little bit, but just take in the, the, the magnitude of the 120,000 men that died and they're only left with 15,000 men after this, this great uh, victory is, is continuing to uh, go forth from the children of Israel. Verse 11, And Gideon went up by the way of them that dwelt in tents on the east of Noba and Jogbeha, and smote the host, for the host was secure. And when Zeba and Zalmanah fled, he pursued after them and took the two kings of Midian, Zeba and Zalmanah, and discomfited all the host. And this is, we're not going to read the rest of the story, but... He gets his son, he's like, he's going to have his son, you know, chop off their head, basically, and his son was kind of afraid, and they're like, you just do it, like, we'd rather have you do it than him anyways, because strength of a man, and, um, and he ends up taking, you know, taking their heads, and it's just this total, complete victory, again, by the Lord against the people that hated him, and going back to Psalm 83, so verse 11 is the one that said, Make their nobles like Orban and Zeb, yea, all their princes as Zeba and as Zalmana, who ultimately all found their fate. All of them died with the host. All of them fled, right? All these, these, these uh, princes and these kings, they all ran away, but they still ended up getting caught and still ended up getting killed. But look at verse 12. It says, Who said, Let us take to ourselves the houses of God in possession. They had no problems desecrating the house of God. They had no problems just coming in and stealing from the house of God and doing whatever they wanted, no regard to the Lord. These wicked kings that were coming in and oppressing the people, this is how they felt, and this is who they were, and this is also now how the children of Israel uh, in the Psalm 83 are approaching the Lord and asking for that help and saying, look, Make them like these other wicked kings. Make their nobles like these other wicked kings who were desecrating your temple and didn't care about your name and they hated you. Uh, bring them down just like you've done in the past. Look at verse number 13. Oh my God, make them like a wheel as the stubble before the wind, as the fire burneth the wood, and as the flame setteth the mountains on fire. So persecute them with thy tempest and make them afraid with thy storm. So they want, because I mean, think about it, you've got this confederation of these wicked heathen, they're going to be lifted up, they're going to be thinking, yeah, we're going we're gonna to take these people out, no problem, right? So what they're saying is, God, send your fire among them, make them afraid, make them fear, make them uh, be abased and brought down and brought low make them afraid with thy storm with your tempest you know just make it extremely difficult make them experience the turmoil and the wrath that you could bring upon them and and level them and abase them and bring them down verse 16 says fill their faces with shame that they may seek thy name o lord and, and I love that, that that's thrown in there in verse 16. Fill their faces with shame. So they should be ashamed. They should be ashamed at ever trying to fight against the Lord. They should be ashamed when they lose with this great multitude against a small people, right? 
but they should ultimately be ashamed for their deeds, for their actions, for their fighting against God. And ultimately, what they're requesting of God is to just bring them down so much and bring, make the victory so great that they would be completely ashamed. And then, you know what, maybe they'll seek your name. When the people see this great deliverance of God's people, when, the, when, when people see how much the name of Jehovah, that the world's going to know uh, that the Lord, that God, whose name alone is Jehovah, are the most high over all the earth, that you're not just the God of the plains and we're the gods of the hills and all this other nonsense like these other kings have thought in the past when God shows up and delivers, but that he's the God of the whole earth. And before we close, I, I've spent a little bit of time with this previously when we went over uh, Psalm 68, but I'm going to cover it again tonight just because when you're out dealing with Jehovah's Witnesses, this is where they want you to turn first. Psalm 83, right? So turn if you turn to Psalm. I love when they say that. They don't want to tell you where they don't want to tell you where they're going. Hey, could you you got a Bible there? Can you turn to Psalm 83? Then you know exactly where they're going. Do, do you know what God's name? Do you know what God's name is? So we're going to cover a little bit about the name of God. Uh, hopefully this is review for you, but um, when, when the, the wording here says, for his name alone, or excuse me, his name alone is Jehovah, that does not say, for his only name is Jehovah. Because there is a difference between his name alone and his only name. They treat it as if the book says his only name is Jehovah. But that is clearly false, as I'm going to demonstrate to you with some passages from Scripture tonight. There are many, many more. I'm not going to, like I said, I'm not going to go super in-depth on this. But uh, if you would just turn quickly to Psalm 148, we literally have the same exact wording found in Scripture, except it doesn't say Jehovah. It, it literally says his name alone is. The same exact sentence structure, right? Psalm 148, verse 13. And this is easy to remember. If you just, this is usually the place that I will go to if someone, if I, if I do end up getting a conversation with Jehovah's Witness, and I do, uh, you know, consider with them Psalm 83. This is the easiest place to show them a verse, to just say, okay, well, you know what? His name's also excellent. And just, and, and, and just show that to him and be like, well, look, it says his name alone is Jehovah, right? And Psalm 148 is easy to remember. Because even if you don't remember 148, just go to the, to the end of Psalms. The last Psalm, it'll probably all be on the same page. Because Psalm 149, 148, 150, these are all short Psalms. So, like, just go to the end of the book of Psalms if you don't remember the exact number. And just look real quick, like, oh, yeah, there it is, Psalm 148. I mean, if you remember Psalm 148, it's even better, but... It's just, it's super easy to go back and find, just be like, yeah, it's, it's at the end of the book of Psalms. Oh yeah, there it is. You don't have to look very hard to find it. Verse 13, Psalm 148, let them praise the name of the Lord, right? The name of the Lord, you could say Jehovah. Let them praise the name of Jehovah. Fine, it says Lord, it means Jehovah, right? For his name alone is excellent. His glory is above the earth and heaven. But that's just a title. It says his name. <laughs> Yeah, it's an adjective. He's, he is excellent. But, it, but it's also his name. His name alone is excellent. But that doesn't mean his only name is excellent. It's, it's another one of his names. God is not the God of one name. Because God can't just be fully encapsulated just with one name, I don't think. There's just too many attributes of the Lord that make sense for him to own it, right? He owns Jehovah because he is the Lord, the boss, like the supreme, right? The almighty. Lord, boss, like, like that, like he is it. He embodies that. But just like previously when, when he met, when Moses talked to God at the burning bush, he said, I am. Because he's eternal. I am. 
I am that I am because I am he has no beginning no end no creator he has always been and always will be is just the I am the I am that brought everything into creation that's who God is that's his name who should I say what's your name I am that I am tell him that what's your name what should I tell him I am again it's it's a it's an embodiment of who the Lord is God owns that just as much as his name is Jehovah and look I have no problems with the name Jehovah I think it's great it's a it's a name of the Lord and we ought to reverence and respect that because when the Bible says that his no like whose name alone is Jehovah you shouldn't be naming anyone else Jehovah because his name alone is Jehovah when you have a, when you have a son or a daughter don't name them excellent I mean, I don't care if you're a big Bill and Ted fan. Most of you probably don't even know what I'm talking about. Don't name them. Excellent. Some people get it. Thank you. His name alone is excellent. His name alone is Jehovah. That's a, that's a title. That's, that's not just a title, but it's that name that's reserved for the Lord alone. Even in Exodus chapter 6, and you could turn these places or not if you want to, Exodus chapter 6, verse number 2, the Bible says, And God spake unto Moses and said unto him, I am the Lord. And I appeared unto Abraham, unto Isaac, unto Jacob, by the name of God Almighty. And again, Joe, like, it's not his name, it's a title. Look, it's his name. It's what the Bible says. The name of God Almighty. What's God, what, what did Moses, what did, uh, what did Abraham, excuse me, what did Isaac what did Abraham called, call God? God Almighty. Did he call him Jehovah? No. He didn't. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, they didn't call the Lord. They didn't call Jehovah, Jehovah. Because they didn't know that name. They didn't even know that name. And people want to make such a big deal about the name Jehovah to where it's just like, that is the only thing that you want to talk about. Well, what's his name? Or even the first thing you want to talk about. Well, for people who didn't know it before, and then as we're going to see in a, in a few minutes, there's actually another name that we really ought to be talking about that's more important for us to be talking about the name. Look, again, no problems, nothing wrong with Jehovah, but there is one, if you're going to only get one name out there to talk about to someone, that name is going to be the name of Jesus Christ. That's the name you want to, that you need to be talking about above all other names. And it doesn't mean that Jesus is better than Jehovah. So that's, not, that's not it at all. But since I'm already going there, the Bible says, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Amen. That's why you're going to need to talk about Jesus, because that's the name given among men under heaven whereby you must be saved. Just as Philippians 2 says in verse 5, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus who being in the form of God thought it not robber to be equal with God. And this is probably why they don't like just talk, they want to talk about Jehovah and not Jesus because Philippians 2 destroys their notion the Jehovah's false witnesses that Jesus, they, they claim that Jesus was just a man and not God. They don't believe in the deity of Jesus Christ. Well, Philippians 2 5 says let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God and how can you be equal with God unless you're God how, how think about that for a second how is that even possible for a person for a person for anyone any any being to be equal with God without being God how could someone who's not omniscient, omnipresent, right? All powerful, all knowing, all existent. How can you anything even come close to saying, well, yeah, I'm equal, if you don't already possess those attributes? It's impossible. It would be, it's laughable to say, to say anything of the sort. But it's not robbery for Jesus to be equal with God because he was God. Verse 7 says, But made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. Made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above 
every name. Jehovah gave Jesus a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That's the name, if you're going to talk about any name, how about the name that was given that is above every name? That's the name we need to be focused on. If you want to talk to me about the name Jehovah, I want to talk to you about the name Jesus Christ. They don't even know Jehovah. Because if they knew Jehovah, they'd know Jesus. Because there's no separating them. At the end of the day, there's one God. There's one Lord. Isaiah 9, 6 says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called. His name. And there's a whole list. His name shall be called. Wonderful. Now, if that's the only name, then the rest of this wouldn't make sense. No, his name shall be called Wonderful. His name also shall be called Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. It lists off all these things. Why? Because that's the name. These are the names, plural, that Jesus is ascribed. Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God. Oh, but he's not almighty. I literally have people say that. Like, that's so stupid. What, and, and here's the answer to that. How many gods are there? Ask the Jehovah's Witness, how many gods are there? If you want to show them Isaiah 9, 6, which is a great verse to show them, clearly referencing the Son that's given, Jesus Christ. There's no disputing that whatsoever. They won't argue about that, to my knowledge. I've never had one tell me that that's not talking about Jesus. I just have them say, well, it's not the Almighty God. How many gods are there? Well, well, there's one. What? Well, there's, there's many. I mean, there's gods, many, and lords, many. Yeah, that's talking about devils. Is Jesus a devil? It's a pretty easy conversation to have, actually, but the hard part is for them to repent and see the truth and accept, accept the truth. It's easy, you know, it's easy for you to show them the truth. It's harder for them to accept the truth. But these are great passages to show because if you don't have the right Jesus, you don't have salvation. Even in Psalm 68, 4, the Bible says, Sing unto God, sing praises to his name, extol him that rideth upon the heavens by his name, Yah, and rejoice before him. Another name of God. Psalm 111, 9 says, He sent redemption unto his people. He hath commanded his covenant forever. Holy and reverend is his name. Which, by the way, this is a reason why I will never willingly or choose for anyone to call me Reverend Burzens. And I, and I mean that. Like, I'm not kidding about that because some people who don't know will say things like that. Or Father, right? Because Jesus said, call no man on earth your Father. You have one Father in heaven, right? And, and there are plenty of Christian denominations that will use the word Reverend. And I always, if I hear it, I'll correct people and say, no, no, I'm not reverend. I'm pastor or brother or whatever. Like you want to use a title, that's fine, but use an appropriate one. And I, don't, I try to be nice because usually people are just ignorant of that. But, I, but look, we still ought to be serious about this because if we see a reference for God's name being holy and God's name being, you know, being reverend and God's name being excellent and God's name being Jehovah, like... I'm not, I'm not, I don't want that ascribed to me. It's not right. These are, these are, these are names that God gets. I mean, I mean, think about it. You want someone calling you the Prince of Peace? Like, no. That's, that's Jesus' name. That's ascribed to him. So when you're looking for baby names, you know, a lot of times people look to the Bible. You've got your little, tons of names. I mean, you can just go to Numbers, Right? You can go to First Chronicles. You're going to see a lot of names, lots and lots of names to choose from. Here's some names not to pick. <laughs> right? Don't forget these ones. Just remove these. Jesus, take it off the list. 
just because you're pronouncing it in, with, with, you know, in, in a different language, look, it's the name of Jesus. Let's not, let's not give that name to other people. Now, like Christian, I have no problem with that. Because you are, like we are, he, believers are described as Christians, right? We're followers of Christ. It's great. So you can, you can, you can assign, ascribe that name to someone because you want them to be a, you know, it's like, hey, Christian, yeah, it's fine. But, but no, you know, let's, let's keep the, the names reserved to God for God. And, and, and exalt the name of the Lord and, and be serious about it, right? Like, the fact that someone may want to talk about the name of the Lord, I don't think is a bad thing. But obviously, the Jehovah's Witnesses are, are really screwed up about that. And they've got the wrong God. They've got the wrong Jesus. They don't even know. So they need to be shown and don't spend much time on that. This is my, my, my final point. Just don't spend time with them if they go, if they go into that. Show them, the verse, show them Psalm 148. Just, just go there real quick. Hey, look. Look at what it says here. Right? His name alone is Jehovah. His name alone is excellent. So are you going to talk to me about excellent this whole time? Or do you just want to keep talking about Jehovah? Like it's, let's not get too focused on that. Let me just show you this verse about Jesus. Let's go to Philippians chapter 2. In fact, we could, we could, we could cover a lot of ground in Philippians chapter 2. And, and don't be a jerk about it, right? Like, obviously, the way that I preach behind the pulpit to the saved, to the believers, is not the same that you go out and talk to people who are unbelievers, who are, you know, who oppose themselves, that you just, just bring forth the word uh, with meekness and show them, right, the error of the way, but, but, but do so, obviously, firm, but, but in a way that, uh, we're, we're not trying to provoke the people we're trying to win to Christ. Uh, but if they won't listen, obviously, some, sometimes they might even need to be rebuked, but uh, uh, warn them of going to hell. But, um, yeah, so remember these, these things. Great passage, pleading to God for his deliverance and his salvation. Let's bow our heads have a word of prayer. Uh, dear Lord, we love you. We thank you so much for the Bible. We thank you for these great words of wisdom. I pray that you would please just uh, strengthen us, dear Lord, and, and help us uh, day to day, especially if, if our lives seem to be going crazy and uh, we're, we feel like we're dealing with, with multiple tribulations and trials, dear Lord, that um, you just show yourself strong for us and, and strengthen us, dear Lord. And um, God, we love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.